Well, good evening. This is Pastor Sean at the First Baptist Church of Oneida welcoming you to our Wednesday night service. We pray that God is blessing you with a great week, and we are glad that you have decided to join us. Tonight's Bible study will be in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So if you have a Bible handy, I would ask you to find your Bible and be turning to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. Before we do that, though, we always want to pause and pray, remembering those in our community who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are in the nursing home, and those who are in need uh, at this very hour. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for fellow churches. And let's pray that God would have his will and his way in each one of our lives as we seek to live out our profession of faith that says Jesus Christ is Lord. All right? Let's pray this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made, Lord, and I pray that we will rejoice and be glad in it. God, thank you as we look around uh, East Tennessee and, and behold your beauty, Lord. We recognize that this is just a, a wonderful place to live. Lord, I thank you for the security that we have and the peace, Lord, and I, I pray that we uh, never take it for granted how blessed we are to live in such a wonderful place. Father, we have gathered tonight to open up your word, and I pray, Lord, that your word will speak to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that we will understand what's going on in the Old Testament narrative, and that the Old Testament predicted Jesus Christ, and the New Testament presented Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I thank you for the copy of this word that I have from Genesis to Revelation, I have many Bibles, Lord, and I'm, I have access to the Scriptures so that I can meet with you and learn more and more about your characteristics, about your character, about who you are. Lord, shape us and mold us as your disciples more and more into your image, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 8 here this evening, and let's talk about the history of Israel. I remember from reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul had talked about these things were given as an example, and he was talking about what had happened to the people of God in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament gives us so many fascinating stories about the journey of God's people out of Egypt as God begins to call uh, a nation unto himself and a group of people through uh, Father Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham gets his call to get up out of Ur of the Chaldees and go and just by faith go where God tells him to go. And he told Abraham he would make him a father of uh, many nations, of many people. And so as we track the children of Israel, you know, all the way from like Abraham and we move to Moses and we get into the Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we think about how the children of Israel uh, kind of, it almost seems like they would take two steps forward, two steps back. You know, they cried out a lot against Moses and was very upset with him about, you know, why did you bring us out of this land of Egypt for us to die? And Moses and Joshua had their hands full as they tried to lead the people. But God wanted his people to be a unique kind of people, a different people, a special people, if you will. And, and one of the principles that I want to share with you tonight is found in 1 Samuel chapter 8 because the people are going to demand, now they are going to be adamant that they want a king. And the phrase that I want you to really listen to or think about, let it marinate in your mind, is this phrase that says, like other nations. Now, let's think about this. When they were brought out of Egypt and they were going into Canaan land at that time, all right, you remember Joshua and Caleb went ahead in the book of Numbers and gave the report, and only two people gave a good report. The rest of them all oh, were, were as grasshoppers, you know, they said, in the sight of these, these huge people. But Joshua and Caleb said, hey, let's do it. Let's go. All hands on deck. And, and, and they were to go into Canaan land and to be a distinct, separate kind of people, not like all the other nations, all right? This was God's chosen, special people. 
But you know what they did when they got into these different nations? I've uh, preached from Daniel before and used this phrase. They blended, all right? They bended and they blended, if you will. And I pray that you and I don't bend nor blend into the society that's ungodly, all right, that we live in today. We need to stand on the Word of God and not be like other nations, so to speak. But we need to be a holy people because we are a chosen generation, a holy people. And 1 Peter 2, 9 talks about that uh, in the New Testament. But this is the folly that I want you to see tonight of the children of Israel when they basically say, God, Yahweh, you're not good enough. We want a human king. And beloved, that's what they're saying in essence is that God is not adequate. He's not good enough. He's not big enough. He is not what they need. Therefore, they're going to demand that Samuel, the aged prophet, that Samuel give them a king. Now, I've shared with you all before. I'm 45, be 46 here in, uh, you know, several months, but I'm 45 and a half, and I can remember Garth Brooks was really big in the 90s. Y'all remember Garth Brooks, and he had a song entitled, uh, Sometimes I Thank God for Unanswered Prayer. Now, I don't like the next phrase because many people refer to God as the man upstairs. God is not the man upstairs. Let's not talk about him as being the gray-headed man in the sky or the man upstairs. No, God is God, God Almighty, okay? But I, I know how a lot of people just say that term, uh, but it's, it's not a very respectful term in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, remember when you're talking to the man upstairs, and just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. And sometimes I believe that what God can give us or what God does give us is the things that we ask him for, and sometimes we don't pray according to his will. Sometimes the worst thing that God can give us is what we want. Can I say it like that? Let me say that again. Sometimes the worst thing that God could or can give us is what we want because we pray not according to his will, but according to our own fleshly desires. And because the children of Israel are not where they need to be and they don't understand who God is, I want you to listen to this story and see how they put this pressure on Samuel to give them a king. And even though Samuel tells them, okay, that you asked for it, you're going to get it. And they still say, okay, we want it. All right. And it's almost like I go back to Joshua and, you know, Joshua calls them out on the carpet at Shechem and tells them, choose this day. And they say, we're going to choose the Lord. And Joshua says, you can't choose the Lord because you're still serving idols, the idols from your fathers and their fathers. And, and, and they're like, no, far be it from us. We're going to serve the Lord. Well, Samuel's going to say, okay, okay, you ask for it, now you're going to get it. And I want you to see what happens when the children of Israel trade the God of this universe, the almighty Yahweh, the provider, Jehovah Jireh, so many names for God in the Old Testament that I could share with you tonight. But they trade him in. It's like a trade. We want a human king to rule over us instead of this God who has brought us out of the land of Egypt. Instead of this God who has loved us all this way. Instead of this God who has provided for us. Instead of this God who knows what's in our best interest. We're going to trade him in. We want a human king. Oh, what folly we see tonight. So... In our hermeneutical questions, or the questions that we ask about the text, let me remind you now, I want you to ask yourself, what does this passage say about God? I have about 10 or 11 questions that I normally spout out, but I'm not going to go through all of them, but you church members at First Baptist Sonata, you've heard me say this before. What does this passage say about God? What does this passage say about mankind? All right, And I want you to see a couple other questions that, that I'm always asking. Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an error to mark? There is a crystal clear error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, in the text tonight. When we look at 
the fact that God's not good enough for them. They want a human king, and they trade Almighty God in for a human, fallible person. Now, God is infallible, right? He's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's love. We can say all these things about God. He's sinless, he's perfect, he's holy, and yet these people want a fallible, sinful, fleshly king who is not righteous, who is not holy, as, as good as they are. Their righteousness would be as filthy rags, just like ours, okay? So, Israel demands a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and this is not a very encouraging story. So let's learn from it. Listen to what the Bible says. 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. The Bible declares, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Now, right off the bat, we see errors to avoid because the first thing we notice uh, as you think about fallible human beings is we are prone to wonder, and we see even Samuel's sons, he's old at this time, his sons did not walk in his ways. Isn't it sad when we fail to pass down the faith. Now, the Bible doesn't say that uh, Samuel was not faithful because the Bible actually says that uh, Samuel was faithful. Samuel uh, told the people of Israel, see if you can find any charge against me, and they couldn't find any charge against him in his life. So it wasn't Samuel's fault. Samuel did what he was supposed to do, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. There's that phrase that I want you to see. Okay, Look with me distinctly at verse 5. All right, the Bible tells us in verse 5, very clear, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Well, I told you in the introduction that Israel was never meant to be like all the other nations. They were to be a separate people. They were to be a different people. And the Bible reminds us, and let me just read first Samuel, I mean first Peter two nine, the Bible says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We, like the children of Israel, are called out of the darkness, and we are to be a chosen generation, priesthood. We are a special kind of people. We are not to be like all the nations, or I would say today, like the world. Okay, We call that uh, peculiar or distinct or separate or sanctified. We are to be set apart, made holy, a different kind of people. But the children of Israel made this proclamation. Now, now notice what it says. This isn't just some um, young lads, some young bucks, some Johnny-come-latelys. These are the elders. These are the older people. These are the ones with gray hair and wisdom, if you will. The Bible says in verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel. So the Bible tells us that, that they must have had a little powwow because they've come together and they thought about this thing and they said, well, we've come to the conclusion that we want somebody to judge us like all the other nations. And oh, how the organizations, no matter whether it's the church or business, so many churches and organizations rise and fall with leadership, whether you like it or not. Like it or lump it, my mom used to say, does not matter. 
Listen to me, all you leaders out there. Organizations rise and fall with, with the leadership. And it's so important for leadership to be on their A game. And what do I mean by that? I mean in tune with the Lord. Knowing what the Lord has in store for them. To be able to look around and see where God is working and say, this is what we need to do. This is where we, what we need to be a part of. All right? They tell him, Samuel, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now I want you to notice this detail as we study the Bible and we digest it and we think about this. Verse 6 gives us a detail that we don't need to gloss over but the thing displeased Samuel now I'm reading from a new King James just to let you know so my translation says but the thing displeased Samuel when they said give us a king to judge us now we've got to ask ourselves why did this displease Samuel because they had God God was their judge he was their leader and Samuel was the man who was anointed from God all right? So it's like they're saying, God, your plan is not good enough for us. We want a new plan. Okay? And basically, when you say God's plan is not good enough, you're saying that God doesn't know what he's doing. And my friend, I pray that you don't operate like that. Because when trials and tribulations come, when you don't know where to go, when you don't know what to do, I use the phrase, when the bottom falls out, uh, when the wheels fall off, uh, and you might even say, when all hell breaks loose, what are you going to do? The first place you ought to go to is to the Lord. Go to God. He knows best. God knows best. But by the way, these people are acting, they're saying, no, God doesn't know best. We want a king. Samuel, you're not good enough. God, you're not good enough. Samuel, you're getting old. And besides, your boys are... Uh, not walking in your ways. Give us a judge or a king to judge us. Now notice what the Bible says. So Samuel, what does Samuel do? Samuel prays because he's obviously in a tough spot. The Bible says, so Samuel prayed to the Lord and this is what the Lord said to Samuel. Give them what they want. Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me. This is God talking now. That I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt. Even to this day. With which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now therefore heed their voice. However you shall solemnly forewarn them. And show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So you know what's happening, church family? God is saying, Samuel, give them what they want. And that's why I said sometimes the worst thing that God can give us is some, th some of the things that we pray for. And that's why, you know, many of us may be able to relate to that song that we thank God for unanswered prayers because as we look back, we think, man, if I would have uh, got that uh, prayer answered the way I wanted it, I would have been in a heap of trouble. Or I would have been up the creek without a paddle. And God, but, and here's the thing, church, and you know this. God knows what he's doing. God knows best. God's ha God has a plan for each and every one of us. And we need to submit to that plan and just to look to him daily for our sustenance. We need to, to uh, fully rely on God each and every day. Now, I want you to see how gracious God is. Because God says, okay, Samuel, give them what they want. Heed their voice, but now I want you to tell them what they're getting. Now, this is, this is not a surprise. God is not surprising them. He's going to give them a detail of what they are getting up front. And this is, I, I think it's just grace. God's grace is oozing out of this passage because he says, okay, you want that? I'll give you that. But let me tell you what you're getting, all right? So Samuel, the Bible says in verse 10, told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, now listen to this, church. This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. Will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. 
He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord, here's the most sad, devastating part in this passage. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. My, oh my, isn't that tragic to think that I'm calling upon the Lord and he's not listening. He's not going to listen. Now, we have a doctrine called the priesthood of the believer. And we believe because Jesus Christ defeated death, hell, and the grave, and the temple veil was torn, that now you and I have access to God all the time. We don't need a mediator. We don't need a chaplain. We don't need a pope. We don't need a priest. You don't need a preacher. Praise God. I want you to understand that. Now, I will pray with you, and I will love on you, but you've got to understand something. You can go to the throne of mercy and grace yourself because of the work of Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through anybody. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you pray to God all, all day, every day. You understand that. You have access. But now, as I think about the privilege of prayer and intercession and praying to God, oh, if I was told the Lord will not hear you in that day, I would be devastated. Oh, God, please, please be attentive to my prayer. Like, like a Nehemiah crying out, Lord, please hear me. Lord, please don't allow me to feel like, and maybe some of us can identify with this, that our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and coming right back down. I felt like that in my prayer life. I'm like, Lord, I'm sending up these prayers, and, and maybe because I was praying not according to his will, or I was asking amiss, you know, they never, they never were answered. The Bible gives us this detail, and because, and, and notice this, verse 18 is very descriptive. The Bible says, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. You made your bed, children of Israel. You lie in it. And because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now, notice this next phrase. I'm not a grammarian per se, but I know what nevertheless means. All right? Now, that's a strong word for me to think about. As a result of what I've just heard, I would think, man, we better change our minds. If I'm a, one of those elders of Israel, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've made a boo-boo here. Let's, go, let's, let's, let's erase this from the record book. Let's not do this, okay? But the Bible says, even after this description from Samuel, from God Almighty, nevertheless, all right, N notice this. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us. That we also, here it is again, underline this in your Bible, go back up to verse 5 of uh, 1 Samuel 8, and it's the last phrase there, like all the nations. Here we see this again. No, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles <laughs> isn't this tragic it's sad because hadn't god been doing that all along yes he had did he not deliver them from so many people so many nations and particularly as we talk about the exodus he had brought them out of the land of egypt had god not provided uh, for them manna in the wilderness and water had god not met their needs absolutely but it wasn't good enough evidently and so they say our king we want one that will judge us and go out before us and fight our battles and here the aged Samuel, you know, is going to make the declaration. And this is what verse 21 says. And Samuel heard all the words of the people. 
and he repeated them. Now notice this. He repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. Now, you're going to see, uh, as you read in your New Testament or Old Testament and in the New Testament, you're going to see this, this storyline of now we go from what we call, a, we have talked about a patriarch society with far, Father Abraham and Moses. And, and what we call this is a theocratic uh, nation where God was leading them. And now they're going to what's called a monarchy. All right. So that means they have a, a king. And, and you're going to look at the coming in of Saul and David and Solomon. And you're going to, you know, observe in the Old Testament the lives of these kings and the many errors that they made. But the point that I want us to see tonight is, is that the children of Israel asked for a human king because they wanted to be like all the nations. And God gave them what they wanted. I'm so glad that God has not answered some of the prayers that I have prayed. And my prayer for each and every one of you watching tonight is, as you think about how good God is, don't trade him in for any idol. Don't think that he's not good enough or big enough or that he doesn't love you. Because I assure you tonight that God Almighty does love you. You were made in his image and he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins and my sins on Calvary's crimson cross. Oh, the blood that was shed at Calvary. And we were pardoned when Jesus went to the cross and defeated death, hell, and the grave. So th there's no mistaking here tonight how much God loves you. He sent his son to die for you and me. He loves us, okay? And so as we look at the errors of the children of Israel, I pray that we learn that there is uh, no God like Jehovah. Days of Elijah is going through my mind. And I can just sing that chorus of building to that crescendo. There's no God like Jehovah. And as you whisper that, and then you, know, you just keep getting higher and higher. Because that's what the Bible tells us. There's no God like Jehovah. He loves you. And so let's not repeat history, especially this history, because this is sad. And we're going to see a lot of drama. We're going to see a lot of bloodshed. We're going to see murder. We're going to see uh, David commit sin with Bathsheba. Saul has so many uh, issues in his life, and even Solomon himself. Um, we're going to see the humanness of a monarchy. When they had a theocratic dynasty, if you will, or they were led by God, and they said, we want to be like all the other nations. I believe that was their downfall. They were never meant or formed to be like other nations. They were created to be God's chosen people. And so church, you and I are God's chosen people. A royal priesthood. Chosen generation. My prayer for us is that each day we wake up, we go out into the world and we understand that we are his ambassadors and we are going to re represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to the best of our ability. And we're not going to forsake Him because He is Almighty God. All right? I thank you for joining us tonight. And I pray that this uh, spoke to you in some shape, form, or fashion as we ask questions about the biblical narrative and the text. And I pray that God would bless you with wisdom, prudence, Patience, love, joy, gentleness, meekness, fruits of the Spirit, we call them in Galatians 5. But I pray that God would bless you with those and that each day you would get into God's Word and His Word would get into your heart, to your mind, and that God would guard the hearts, the minds, the eyes, and the ears of our children who are growing up in a grotesque society. Let's pour into our children. Let's equip them and let's love them. And let's pray for the youth, for the children of this, uh, this nation as they grow up in some turbulent times. Let's model what it looks like to be a Christ follower. And let's love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And my prayer tonight is that we would love the Lord our God 
with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. Let's pray together. Father, we have a great challenge, Lord, as there are a lot of things that compete with you in our world, but I know that there's no God like Jehovah. All, everything else that is a false idol is, is nothing compared to you, Lord. And so I pray that you would always have the preeminence in my life and the life of the listeners. I pray that we wouldn't make excuses, Lord, but that you would be our priority. That we would love you, Lord. And we wouldn't want to be like other nations or other people, but we would want to be like Jesus. Lord, let others see Jesus in us. Help us to be more, more, more like Jesus. Thank you, Father, for a new day. As uh, Jeremiah said in Lamentations, your mercies are new every morning. I get another shot at living for you uh, today, Lord, and and, uh, I thank you for that. God, help us all walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Help us, Lord, to put on the armor of God. Help us to focus on you. Bless us now, I pray. Be with each one today. Pray that they have a good Thursday tomorrow and Friday, the rest of the work week. And I pray that this coming Sunday, they get into the house of the Lord and they worship. Worship is a verb. It's not come sit and listen and cross your arms. But it's get into that sanctuary, be attentive, be fresh, be listening, and focus. Focus on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because He is worthy. You're worthy of our praise, Jesus. I love you tonight, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Get into your house of worship Sunday and make it a great weekend. Thank you.